Howdy folks! I'm going to talk about a custom terrain painting system that I made from scratch using the Godot game engine. Most games that let you interact with the world's terrain do so with a pretty coarse grid. I wanted to push past the typical grid-based approach so that users can really customize their terrains as they build out their world. With what I've created, it feels really nice to be able to paint terrains, make smooth curves, and just have a good time seeing a new terrain appear at your cursor. My actual terrain painting interface is really simple right now, and most of this devlog's focus is on the underlying storage and rendering system rather than the user interface. Still, it almost feels like a painting app already, and every test run I do, I end up drawing cute faces I made this system because I'm working towards a garden ecosystem game. You want to build up an ecosystem over time by attracting all sorts of different animals to your plot of land. Certain animals, including some of the most basic ones, will prefer to be in certain terrains. Think of worms enjoying dirt, penguins enjoying snow, or crabs enjoying sand. The terrain is the entryway into customizing your area into a certain biome. Some animals might even have the ability to make new terrain. Maybe a worm really likes being in the dirt, but if he can't find any, he'll just make his own patch of dirt. This opens up some cool gameplay mechanics that I'll want to explore later. You might need worms at the baseline to attract certain types of animals, but if you're focusing on other types, then worms could be a nuisance. The rest of this devlog will be pretty technical, and will have some specific references to the Godot engine. I'm going to dive into my thought process on creating the system and the various optimizations I did. So, let's jump into it. Grids are the de facto approach in any sort of runtime terrain editor. Farming games like Stardew Valley often use coarse tiles for farming or placing objects. Minecraft is just one big voxel grid. A few Minecraft clones have optimized to give you smaller voxels, but it's still just a grid. I'll let you in on a secret. Everything you see in any game is a grid. Every image is a grid when you get down into the details. It's just a grid of pixels. Actually, that's not true. Grids don't actually exist. Multidimensional arrays, which is the more technical term for a grid, are made-up concepts for the human brain. It's just a fancy indexing trick. In the background, your programming language is actually indexing a super long one-dimensional array with two coordinates. Or, alternatively, an outer 1D array is storing pointers to more 1D arrays, which might be storing pointers to more 1D arrays, just pinballing pointers into different places in the computer's memory. Well, actually, 1D arrays aren't even real. They're the same thing as standalone numbers, strings, or anything else. Just zeros and ones being stored in a sequence. When we think about it that way, maybe nothing is real. Maybe we're all zeros and ones in someone else's simulation. Maybe we're even running as a simulation on another dimension's smart fridge. Putting aside the philosophical dilemma, I wanted to have a nice terrain editor without it looking like a grid. I'm obviously inspired by Viva Piñata for the game I'm making, and I like their approach of painting new terrains directly on the ground. Weirdly, Viva Piñata lets you freely paint terrain, but uses a grid for object placements, which made customizing your area kind of janky in that game. To make my terrain system, I opted to mask out the different terrain types using a simple label image. The underlying mapping is to an image, but this can give us so much detail to where it looks smooth to the player. A great visual example for what I'm doing is seen here. So this is an image generator that NVIDIA made that does image translation from a label map to a landscape. Given simple labels, textures are painted in to create a realistic image. I'm doing something similar where the underlying data looks like the labels on the left. At runtime, I mask out the different regions and apply shaders to make nice looking terrain. Here's another one where they use some other labels to make a waterfall scene. 
Now, I'm aware that some people online really dislike the use of AI models. Maybe this example falls under that, or maybe just character artwork, I'm not sure. But I do have a PhD in computer science where I focused on generative AI, so I've become kind of desensitized to it. My system maintains an underlying grid of labels that indicates which texture should show up at what pixel in my terrain. At runtime, these labels are converted to an image texture that can be passed into the relevant shaders. I do this step because Godot doesn't give too much control into how images are saved. It doesn't make sense for me to save my labels in a full RGB color space, so this lowers what gets saved to disk by quite a bit. A main terrain shader then uses this info to match the color to the various terrain types I've created. Then the actual shader code for that terrain is run for that pixel. I tried for a long time to pass my labels directly to the shader, but I couldn't figure it out without hard coding the array size. It's probably possible, but a bit too much work for me to strain myself trying to figure it out at this point. So, looking up an image pixel by UV coordinates on a plane is pretty easy, but my grass shader is actually applied to each mesh in the multi-mesh instance that makes up my grass. To make rendering for this grass and whatever else I add work, I manually compute the UV by comparing the vertex position relative to the actual terrain grid object's position, orientation, and size. This is done by taking the instanced object's vertex position. Vertex position tells where a given vertex for the mesh exists relative to the entire mesh. I recompute this in world space coordinates to figure out where the grass mesh is. Then. I take the world space coordinates and map that to the terrain grid's local space. From here, I can look at this position relative to the actual size of the grid, where each tile is always going to be one square unit, and figure out the blade of grass's UV position relative to the terrain. This works great for the grass particles I have right now, but also means I could render rocks, weeds, or anything else I wanted purely using instancing and shaders. For drawing terrain, I just have a really simple API. I can look up a position in world spaces coordinates relative to the pixels in the grid, and then I can call a simple drawing function that will draw a circle at the requested point. I started working on this terrain system with a performance goal in mind, to store and render a 100 by 100 meter grid as the active patch of terrain. I chose for each 1x1 one one meter square to then represent 40x40 40 40 pixels. That makes it so that each pixel is approximately a square inch. I'm not planning on making my animals a realistic scale, so that seems like plenty of detail for the purposes of my game. Note that I do pretty much all my work on a crappy laptop with an integrated GPU, so this was a tough challenge in any case, and I crashed my laptop an unholy amount of times. Just slapping the terrain labeling texture to an image might work, but it is prone to some issues. Firstly, the terrain labels map to a 4000 by 4000 pixel image. If you just put it onto one single image, that'd be a 64 megabyte image that needs to be saved into the project to be able to see that data in the editor. Whereas, if you're able to store the labels as bytes, you can get some pretty significant performance savings there. Another issue is culling. If this was rendering onto one single plane, we couldn't take advantage of culling that's built into the engine. Instead of only rendering what needs to be seen, every single part of that plane would need to be rendered, including the multi-mesh of the grass. This is still true even if only a corner is visible. First, let's talk about how we'll handle culling. First, what is culling? So culling techniques allow a graphics renderer to only render what is actually visible to the player at a given point in time. Without culling, every single object would need to be passed through the graphics pipeline, even if they contribute to zero pixels drawn. You can see in this example, we have a person and some trees around them, and you can imagine them, some of these trees being rendered despite not being seen on the player's screen. 
Occlusion culling is the handling of objects that are completely blocked by objects in front of them. You can see in this example, one tree is completely occluded, so it's safe to skip over. Frustum culling limits rendering only to objects that are actually within the bounds of the camera. So everything behind or to the sides of the player can be skipped over. Because a giant 100 by 100 meter plane would only be one object in your engine, it can't benefit from culling. The whole thing would load into the GPU at once, even if very little of the plane is visible. This lack of culling actually isn't a big deal if we really were only dealing with a giant plane. Even using cool shaders and a 4000 by 4000 image, rendering a plane isn't very expensive. But I have a multi-mesh on top of this plane for the blades of grass. My highest level of detail is 2048 blades in a single tile. That would be 20 million blades of grass if we rendered the whole thing at once. Note the grass mesh is instanced, so it only needs to load into the GPU once, but this is still very excessive for my sad little laptop. My solution was to break the mesh up into different tiles. I made it so that each tile occupies one by one meter. So I split up my terrain into individual tiles. This gave me a few advantages. First, each tile is considered its own object, so culling works immediately through the engine. Two, I can dynamically resize the grid if I want to. Then each tile has its own multi-mesh grass, so roughly only the grass which should be rendered is being rendered at the coarseness of the level of tiles that I have. Finally, there's level of detail. So I wrote a simple script that can maintain a level of detail for the grass. At certain distances from the camera, the grass multi-mesh gets replaced with more or less instances to keep the total render count reasonable. Far away, I just show the terrain texture on the flat plane. Each tile is doing this independently, so there's a smooth transition from high to low detail. I originally had the idea to create a different image texture for each tile. I thought this would help with updating the terrain as the user drew on it, because only the local area that gets changed would need its texture updated. Also, GPU hardware has a limit to the texture size that can be loaded in. It's something like 16,000 by 16,000 pixels for modern hardware, so that's not much of an issue yet. I can just chunk different 100 by 100 meter grids if that becomes a problem later. But this results in 10,000 image texture objects being maintained. Even though the number of pixels was the same, Godot did not like this at all, and everything slowed down with a lot of random crashes. It ends up that Godot's image texture.update function built into the engine does a good job itself of updating a texture in real time, so I was trying to solve a problem that didn't really need solving. I want to highlight something silly with Godot, as it caused a lot of random issues for me while I was trying things out to optimize my system. GDScript is a high-level language with data types like int, float, string, and more. Now, recall that I decided to store my labels as integer values rather than using full images in an effort to save space. Each terrain type is a different numeric label, and I don't expect to have more than a handful of terrain types. I was storing these as an array of int when writing my Godot code. Now, most low-level languages have a wider set of types. You can specify if data is signed or not and its bit depth. For example, UN8 have a range from 0 to 255 and are really common for representing image color channels in other applications. It ends up that Godot stores ints at a precision that many other languages would call a long long, or 64 bits per value. This has just millions of possible values in it. At first glance, it might seem that this is just a quirk of Godot, uh, and something you just have to deal with when using such a high-level language. I was storing my terrain labels as array of int, and this was being serialized to disk. For context, a whole pixel in RGB32 color space is going to be 32 bits, so my labels were taking up more memory than the image I was converting them to. I was actually losing precision. But I noticed there are some GD script classes specifically for this. They're just kind of hard to notice. Packed whatever array is an alternative to regular typed arrays, which can store data in a compressed format. To get regular sized ints from other languages, you can use a packed int32 array, 
to get bites or UN eights, um, so values from zero to two fifty five, you can use a packed byte array. These classes share a lot of syntax with regular arrays, giving you things like append, indexing, size, and more. So in my case, it was almost drag and drop to switch out these uh, data containers. Now, I don't think there's a dedicated class to get behind uh, byte size, but you could store even smaller data if you use clever indexing and masking of values. I'm not dealing with that yet, but if my laptop starts stressing later, I might revisit it. This was a really simple change that literally lowered the size of my data by eight times, so I thought it was worth mentioning. If you work with lower level languages, you might be used to thinking of the bit depth of your data types, but it wasn't immediately obvious that this is even a Godot feature uh, because of the very different naming conventions between array of int and packed byte array. At this point, we have a nice editable terrain storage system that takes up very little space when saved. But there's a glaring issue. You wouldn't be able to see anything until the texture gets created and passed to the shaders. So I wouldn't be able to see my terrain in the editor, and I'd need to run a debug build anytime I worked on it. To solve this, I decided to make the terrain generation process run in the editor as a tool script. I have a custom node called a terrain grid and a resource called terrain grid data that serializes the labels. These are both tagged as tool scripts so they function in the editor. When the terrain grid enters the scene tree, it starts the process of unpacking my terrain labels into an image, creating tiles, and assigning the newly created texture to the tile shaders. This means I can see everything in the editor. I haven't worked much with tool scripts before in Godot, so this was a messy process to get started. I crash the editor constantly. If you look up issues around tool scripts, you run into a lot of posts by people like me trying to do complex things and running into issues. I'm going to share some of the pain points that I ran into that might help you avoid if you try working on similar stuff in the future. First, I crash the editor repeatedly. You're supposed to get a stack trace when the editor crashes if you're running it from the command line, but 90% of the time I never saw an error message. This might be because I was multi-threading inside my tool scripts, so errors on the threads may have never printed. Second, the only way I could find to reliably refresh my tool scripts was to reload the entire project. Unlike regular scripts, tool scripts load once and then are unable to change. My project is small and reloads quickly, but this could be a big problem in a more mature project. And then finally, a huge point of contention for me is that my tool scripts were accessing resources and other object data. Code that runs in the ready function typically has the assumption that the child node's ready functions have already been called and that export variables are already created. This isn't necessarily true in tool scripts running in the editor, so you have to verify yourself that everything you need has already been created. That about wraps up this video. I was going to talk a bit more about the issues I ran into with multi-threading and how I plan to sort of expand on this to create a larger scale scene that we can chunk to have infinite tiles. But I think I'm going to call it here. I actually have no idea if this sort of long form sort of slideshow type of content is even entertaining. Um, but if you stuck around this long, I'd be happy to hear any comments, any questions you have. Yeah, and thank you so much for sticking around and, and listening to me ramble about terrain systems. See you in the next one.